name is Jo Collins and I'm an Injury Prevention Coordinator at Injury Matters. I'm very excited tonight to welcome everyone back for our second annual Falls Prevention Forum for WA. Um, it's really, really nice to see just as many other health professionals out there that are just as excited as we are about preventing falls in WA. So today we host this event on Wajak Noongar country um, at the Lake Gallup, also known as Lake Munga, to come together, share knowledge about falls prevention, and also to build new connections in the sector. I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional custodians of the land in which I stand today and pay my respects to their, to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend this to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the room with us or joining online with us today. Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So before we get started today, I'll just go through a few little housekeeping rules for us. So for those joining us in the room today, um, our toilets are just located at the back of the room um, to your left or right, depending on which way you're facing. <laughs> um, evacuation, in the case of uh, evacuation or an emergency, the evacuation site is downstairs and across the road on the grass. Hopefully we don't have to come to that, but just in case. Out of respect to all of our presenters and panellists um, today, um, I do ask that you please make sure that your phones are turned to silent. We do also have quite a big audience joining us online today. Um, so just to ensure that everyone can participate um, and everyone can hear what's going on, I do ask that if you're asking a question um, or responding or making a comment that you do wait until we bring a microphone around just so that everyone can hear us. So we do have the lovely Sandy in the back in white. Sandy will be roaming around the room with a microphone just to make sure that everyone can hear us. Um, and while I'm talking about Sandy, <laughs> um, we'll be taking some photos throughout the event as well. Um, you have all signed a photo consent on the way in. Um, if at any point you do change your mind or you wouldn't like any photos taken, please do let one of us know and we'll just make sure that you're not in any photos. And then for the people joining us online today, welcome. We can't see you, <laughs> but we know that you're all there tuning in. Um, I ask that you please double check that all your microphones are muted. Um, again, just out of respect for all of our presenters so that we're not getting that noise coming through. If you have more than one person um, joining you in the room, um, we'd appreciate it if you could just send us a quick private message in the chat tab on Zoom and let us know how many people are joining in with you. And if you have any questions for our presenters or for our panel discussion later, um, please pop these into the Q&A tab. Um, and also let us know who the questions directed at as well to the panel, um, if, if you've got a particular person that you're directing a question to. And finally, if you face any technical, um, technical difficulties during today's event, um, we do have a poo online um, to assist you with any difficulties that you might have. So tonight's event is being hosted by Injury Matters in partnership with the Australian Association of Gerontology or the AAG. So just a little bit about us before we get started into our speakers. So Injury Matters, we're an organisation for safer people and places. And essentially our key purpose is to prevent and reduce the impact of injury in the WA community. And we do this through advocating, providing education um, for injury prevention. And then we also provide support for people that who have been effect, um, uh, impacted by injury. So tonight we are putting our falls prevention caps on to deliver this event through our Stay On Your Feet program with the support from the Department of Health WA. And our Stay On Your Feet program provides information, training and support to both older adult community members and professionals working with older adults, such as yourselves in the room, um, about how you can, can assist to prevent falls in the community. And tonight's event wouldn't be possible without our key partners, the AAG, um, who have enabled our first guest speaker to be here today. So the AAG is an Australia-wide association 
that aims to improve the experience of ageing by connecting research policy and practice. The AAG currently has over 1300 members nationally, um, and this includes researchers, aged care professionals, nurses, health allied health professionals as well. Um, in particular, um, we would like to thank the WA committee of the AAG and Elisa Burton, I'm gonna embarrass you up the back there. <laughs> um, Elisa is also the WA chair of the AAG um, associate of the AAG, um, but yeah, thank you for helping make this happen tonight. Um, we've also had, I just also wanna just very quickly before we get started, just say a quick thank you to our organizing planning committee for tonight's event as well. Um, we obviously have our key partners, but um, we have also had a planning committee of various health professionals that have been really the brains behind the planning of today's event. So thank you to each of you as well. Um, we'll just have a quick look at what falls look like in Western Australia as well, just before I introduce our first speaker. So falls and falls related injuries, we know continue to be a significant public health issue here in WA. That's why we're all here tonight, right? But what does that actually look like for us? So on average, one Western Australian will die from a falls related injury every 25 hours, will be admitted to a hospital for a falls related injury every 17 minutes, and attends an ED department as a result of a fall every 13 minutes. So I know it's really easy to have a look at the stats and the data and for them to just be numbers sometimes. Um, I do wanna highlight that each of these stats is a person, um, a person that, whose life has been impacted by a fall. And I think that really captures why we are all here tonight, why we're all doing the work that we do um, and why, why, what we're trying to achieve in addressing falls prevention in WA. And so this data is just a small snapshot from our 2022 WA Falls report. Um, if you are interested in delving a little bit deeper into the stats of what falls look like in WA, um, we do have copies of the falls report on the resource table, which I can see if you've, you've already grabbed. So <laughs> I'm very excited to welcome our first speaker for tonight, Professor Nari Kurth, who has come all the way from New Zealand just today. Um, so if that isn't impressive enough already, <laughs> Nari is the Joyce Cook Chair in Aging Well and a Professor of General Practice and Primary Healthcare at the University of Auckland. She's a practicing GP and President of the New Zealand Association of Gerontology and is recognised as an international expert in falls prevention, primary healthcare, and also is currently leading several research teams. So everyone please welcome Nari. Well, I didn't actually come from New Zealand today. <laughs> I came from New Zealand yesterday or the day before I've forgotten, but I've been in Albury with Olga. Um, so I need to introduce myself, and for us, we do this in Te Reo Māori, and that situates me in this place as a visitor to your place, and then I'll acknowledge the traditional owners. So, ko hokanui te maonga, ko klutha te awa. Ko Kotarana te Whare Tūpuna, ko Nga Ki Pakiha te Iwi, ko Nga Eri Kuris Tokawingawa, nā reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So my place of origin is the very deep south of, the, of New Zealand, on the banks of the Clutha River, and um, grew up there in rural Southland and then South Canterbury, and uh, from my rural background, I come to a big family. Um, now, I've just got to remember there's a camera there. Um, uh, and so, you know, being number number six of seven kids made me very persistent and very argumentative. And I think that's a very good background for an academic. So I ended up going to university and becoming, uh, went to medical school and got in somehow. And then there was no decisions to be made after that. Married the wrong man. He took me off to Philadelphia. And it was actually in Philadelphia where I got interested in older people because he had finished his PhD when I finished my family medicine residency because I wanted to be a GP. So I had to do something else. The only thing you could do was either hospital administration or geriatrics. So what would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
and then I forgot to finish my acknowledgement. So that's me. And now I'd like to, to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the Wajak Nunga people, and pay respects to the elders past and present um, and emerging, and also reach out to the, all the Aboriginal people who might be online or in the room. Um, and so the rest of my story is really academic. So I went did my geriatric medicine fellowship, came back to New Zealand, wanted to stay forever. Simon then got headhunted to uh, be a postdoc in Melbourne. So then I did my PhD in Melbourne with Leon Flicker and Doris Young. And so yesterday I had the privilege as the, uh, as the Gary Andrews fellow to go to Albury Wodonga to give their address. Um, forgotten what it was called. It was, uh, I know it'll come to me that the John Richards um, Centre, so it was a John Richards oration, and um, lo and behold, there was uh, uh, this Blackberry um, <laughs> who had been also working with Doris in Melbourne for quite a long time and knew Jane Gunn, and so the connections are really important. And so for Māori people, the connections are really important, and I suspect for Aboriginal people as well. So as a New Zealander in your place, I want to reach out to you and say, you're very welcome to come to my place. You know where I'm from now, so there's no excuses. Now, I also know that I can talk all night, so I want to talk about food prevention. Um, and could somebody just give me a wave when I've got five minutes to go? Could we do that? Joe? Thank you. Uh, okay, now let's see if the clicker will go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we're all here because of falls, and this is no surprise to anybody that uh, as you age, this is hospitalizations from falls. I think Keith Hill and I did this as part of an epidemiological thing we were doing back in last century. The patterns haven't changed. Of course, this little blip here is for completely different reasons, but um, this is because of fragility. So hands up in this room who had a fall in the last year. I fall over all the time. Come on, must be more than that. Okay, leave your hand up if you ended up having to go and see a doctor. Okay, not many. How about going to hospital? No. Okay, so if we were all over age 85, then 20% of us would have some significant injury from our fall and probably five would end up in hospital. So this is the fragility with ageing and that's why it's so important. It's in the top three injury-related deaths, reasons for death in older people. Falls, motor vehicle accidents and suicide. So each of those things have really different strategies, right? The specific subgroups you'll all be very familiar with, you know, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, um, people with stroke, people with significant comorbidities. I argue that injury is just the tip of the iceberg. So hip fractures is the most significant injury, causes lots of disability and um, decreasing in function. But actually, any fall is likely to result in a loss of confidence and a loss of independence as a result. So falls are really important. I'm going to continue my, uh, my talk by talking about residential care first. And that's because it's kind of my passion. Um, it is the neglected sector. Nobody likes to talk about it. But I love working in nursing homes. Hands up in this room who can say that. Yes, this is you are my people. This is fantastic. So this is the variability from one of our studies of the fall rates in the 45 um, units or wards that we were working with. Now, they're all very similar people. You walk into a, a home, a, a care home, either at what you call hostels or at nursing home level, and there's very similar people wherever you go. So how can there be this much variability? It is just fascinating to me, and I've spent my career trying to unpick this, and I've been unsuccessful um, because I think it's a combination of many things. The variability of the people you're working with, the variability of the environment, and then you've got the staff. You know, some people can't fall over unless they're dropped. Um, and so I just think it is fascinating, and this is what we have to think about and try hard to work out what's driving that. So the first thing I did when I got back to Auckland and there's my forever home was do a randomised trial which was unsuccessful. I walked into Meg Butler in the lift. Meg Butler, fantastic injury prevention nurse, 
said, I've got this great idea, Nairi. And I said, oh, sounds great. So we worked it up. It was a risk assessment tool, very sensible, very evidence-based. You looked at various things in the person in residential care. You gave them a score. If they were over eight, they were high risk, right? You all know about this. So that's what we did. And then we, with each of those strategies, we, with each of those risk factors, we had some strategies. We developed this beautiful manual. It looked great. And, you know, we had nice little flow charts and we had a falls champion from the facility whose job it was to go off and risk assess everybody, fill in the forms. And we gave them education. We gave them one, two one hour talks about falls. And the nurses knew what they were supposed to do, right? And it was definitely a low intensity uh, intervention which needed no additional resources for the facilities. Key message. And have you worked out which is the intervention or which is the control group here? Unfortunately, the blue one is the intervention group and the pink one is the control group. <laughs> now that's the wrong way round, right? Just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we increased falls by 30%. And unfortunately, we recorded that, counted it, and uh, got it published. It did not stop ACC wanting to take our lovely um, manual, which looked so smart and was low intensity and cheap, and trying to disseminate it widely. I, I had this, you know, this tug of war over the table with them. They said, no, you can't have it. Look, it is harmful. So this is uh, evidence based in the making. But this, why did that happen? I, you know, we puzzled over it, we thought about it. The pattern of injury was exactly the same as this pattern of falls rising after a few months of doing this thing. Was it that we included everybody? We included everybody. So there was potentially some people there that wouldn't have benefited. I think it was that that well-meaning staff member who was running around filling in all the forms was better off doing whatever she did before because it took her off the floor, it took her out of the care environment. Was it that we measured the wrong things? Anyway, whatever it was, it put me on the wrong side of the Cochrane Review line. And then being on that wrong side of the line is uncomfortable. This was quite a long time ago. Okay, so then we did it again. Uh, we thought, okay, low, this was a low, low cost intervention, low intensity meeting. And then the other thing that I did was I went on my Hartness Fellowship and as it, when it was a Hartness Fellow, I actually worked as a care assistant in nursing homes. And I could not work out why they weren't doing what we thought they should be doing. They should be, you know, looking at the things on the wall and they should be doing this and they should be doing that. And I realised that it is a bloody hard job. And you have no time to think about anything except what you've got in front of you. So we then developed that so that we would give the facility the resources. So we gave them a whole gerontology nurse. The gerontology nurse worked with each eligible older person and they set a goal. They did a functional assessment and they devised this patient improvement plan and uh, talked that to the caregiver. And it was very simple exercises. So when you were getting the person dressed in the morning, instead of just doing one of these, you did five of these. You know, simple full prevention exercises. The, if the goal was that they wanted to be able to go out and do the gardening, then they would do more balanced things so that they would be able to reach over, more upper limb things. It was really sensible. And then, the, uh, so it was a cluster randomised trial. So the controlled facilities, they had a social visitor who spent just the same amount of time with the older people because we know that being social is good for older people. So this was a functional assessment goal-setting intervention. We did an outcome evaluation. There was no improvement in quality of life or function between these two groups. And luckily, there was no increase in falls, but there was no reduction in falls either. So then our statistician said, now, hang on a minute. We had pre-specified to look at cognition. And so it turned out that cognition, there was a significant interaction, statistical term, but it meant that when your cognition was good, you had a completely different trajectory on your reaction to the intervention than if your cognition was bad. If your cognition was good, 
actually your function stayed the same, whereas in the control group it went down, so that was a good thing. You didn't get any more depressed and you didn't have any more falls. But if your cognition was poor, you actually got worse and you reported that you had more depression. Luckily, you didn't have any more falls. You know, I should have given up doing research when I got this result <laughs> um, because this isn't supposed to happen. You're supposed to have positive outcomes. But then when you take a step back and you think, look, here we are, the, the goal, you know, here's this poor caregiver. And the caregivers in their interviews afterwards, they said, oh, well, Mildred was good because she knew what was going on. She knew what a goal was. She was engaged and it, did it. But Jack over here, I would come along and I'd be pestering him to do his bloody exercises. He couldn't remember what it was about. He didn't know what his goal was. And so actually, potentially, that was kind of the wrong thing to do, that one-on-one -on -one intervention for the person with dementia. So what we learned from that is that you've got to understand the population and target the intervention. And potentially this uh, functional assessment individual program would be worth it for the right kind of people. So by now, I sort of had thought about things a bit. Oh, we looked at a falls rate analysis. And this is where I tried to keep unpicking what it was that was explaining the variability. So here's the graph of the four groups, the cognition okay, the cognition uh, okay intervention, cognition okay control, and then the cognition impaired intervention. And there's where they had more falls and they didn't do so well. We looked at the significance between these factors and that, and that falls rate. And we saw that in Christchurch, one arm was in Christchurch, one arm was in Auckland. They had almost double the, or 50% more of a falls rate. The older, older age, that makes sense. Actually, females in this analysis had fewer falls. Cognitive impairment actually predicts falls. We all know that. People who were depressed fall significantly more, and this is becoming much more re relevant and important. And of course, prior falls is always the strongest predictor of any future falls. So we tried to use the data as much as we could to do useful things. And then, of course, we started being interested in the Cochrane Review process. Hands up who's been part of a Cochrane Review. Haven't you been a part of a Cochrane Review? Yes, no. one there, not you. Okay, so this is the most pickiest process you can ever imagine. It is really for boffins, isn't it? Um, so you have to go through and you search all of the literature, you find this, the trials that fit just your question, you evaluate them to see whether they're good or bad, you have two different people extract the data, you have a really good quality process, and it is, comes with a really good result but it takes a long time and takes a lot of energy. So Ian Cameron has led this for the last 10 or 15 years. Initially in 2012, there were 60 trials and 60,000 participants. And this is falls for older people in care facilities and hospitals. The 2018 update found another 35 trials. So you can imagine how much work this was. Had a fantastic coordinator in Suzanne Dyer, who did a fantastic job. And so then you, you, I'll just give you some highlights of what happened. So here is the forest plot. Now these work like this. Here's your line of no effect. If you're on this side of the line, you favor the intervention. If you're on this side of the line, you favor the control. And so there's me on the wrong side of the line, <laughs> right? And so I was the only one for a long time. And then finally, somebody else is on the other side of the line too. And when I looked at this trial, it was 16 facilities in Spain and they did a risk assessment and, a, and individualized strategies, but they didn't give them any more resources. And they used the staff that were already there. And I thought, well, risk assessment alone is a waste of time unless you give them the resources to address the risks. And this has become a, an important finding. And I think we're all starting to accept that this is 10 or 15 years after I first observed it. Okay, but overall, of course, these multifactorial interventions, because we're on the wrong side of the line, they cross this line. So we can't say that these multifactorial interventions actually consistently work. 
And I, and I think that that's really important to understand. Working on pool prevention and residential care is hard work. And you've got to be careful to do the right thing and do it properly. The other half of the rule is about falls in hospitals. And I think that you might recognize this, Anne-Marie, so pardon me if I get it wrong, um, but this was an intervention in rehabilitation units, which actually focused on uh, education for the patients and for the nurses. And so it was to raise awareness and raise knowledge about falls. It was to motivate people to get involved in fall strategies. And it was not a small amount of intervention. Each individual got 45 minutes and there were two visits. And then the nurse worked with the, with the, uh, with the units. And there was a multimedia education practice. Was so people were watching videos, they were doing workbooks. It actually took a lot of time and energy. And the staff were trained about falls and patient behaviors. And I really like the design. So this is called a step wedge design where instead of just randomly allocating people to one or the other, that each, everybody who there are the here are the units that were involved, everybody gets the intervention, but they get it in a random order. So therefore you're comparing this group with everyone else, you're comparing the ones here with everyone else, and gradually you get more and more people, who, more and more units who've done the intervention until you've got everybody. So if you look at these little rates here, this says control 13.2, intervention 8.5, looking like it's potentially good. Down here, we've got more people in the intervention, less in the control. The control still is 13.5 and intervention 7.7. .7. So you can see you're able to do the comparisons, but you know that everybody's going to get it. So that was a very successful trial. 40% reduction in falls. It did, however, exclude those people with dementia. So more, another quite important trial of it from hospital practice now. So this is Anna Barker, and they had a very, very successful pilot study of this thing called the six pack. So the six pack is a combination of um, nursing interventions so for patients who are classified as high risk. So there was a full alert sign above the bed. There was supervision of patients while they were in the bathroom. There was more use of low, low beds, low, low beds in the hospital. They ensured that the patient's walking aid was in, within reach at all time. They did sensible things like a toileting regime and they used bed chair alarms. Now, this was supposed to be successful and it was a huge trial 16 medical and eight surgical wards, 46,000 admissions. The uptake was very good. But in this big analysis, there was actually no impact on fall interventions, on fall injuries. And so here, all the hospitals in Australia were waiting again to take this up and do it, but actually it was proven to be ineffective. And when I was talking to Anna at the time of the trial, I, took, I asked her, well, how, what, what's the difference between the pilot study, which was so successful, and this more um, spread out thing. So they did a very good job because they, they actually implemented it in a way so that people, um, so they counted whether the nurses did the right thing, whether people used the, the form alerts, all of those things was, were, were very well done. There was no impact on falls. And she said, well, when the pilot was on, there was also another program going in the same hospital, which was about cognition and cognitive training of people. And that made me think, wow, so, you know, I think cognition is really important for fall prevention. And if you think about when you're walking, the first, when I first knew about falls was when John Campbell, who was my mentor, talked about the walking and talking thing. So if you're walking along like this, and you've got a certain gait speed, and then you interrupt somebody or ask them to talk, and they go... You know, if you take a longer time with that joint task, you are distracting part of your brain, right? Then you are at an increased risk of falls. So it's about the way that your brain works while you're trying to do your motor functions. So potentially we need to think much more about cognitive training along with our, with our, uh, with our intervention. So the summary, care facilities, vitamin D. Does reduce falls, doesn't reduce the proportion of falls, but it reduces the rate of falls. 
And look at this. I was so pleased to see this as a final summary. All risk assessment tools probably make no difference in comparison to nurses' judgments. I think that's really important. Let's teach our nurses. Let's empower them to make decisions and do things. Let's not mess them up with having to fill in a whole bunch of forms. Multi-factor and in hospitals, multi-factor and interventions may reduce the rate of fall, particularly those in the subacute setting. That's because of your trial, Anne-Marie. Important tailored patient education um, it would end up to be the important component. So that's the Cochrane summary for care homes. Now it's pretty hard to read that and say, okay, what am I supposed to do next week in my care home? Right? So potentially during the discussion, we'll have to talk about this. Since we published that, um, the Cochrane Review, there's been two really important trials. One of them is the Hewitt trial, which took 16 care homes and randomized the individuals to have an exercise program, which was special and or not. And the exercise program was attendance at these sunbeam classes for one hour twice a week. Um, and then they all did that. And then the maintenance of half an hour for two weeks. The results showed that the SPPB improved and falls were reduced by a half, 0.45. That's a huge reduction in falls. And the injury was reduced by 40%, but they actually didn't report the significance. Now, the training involved these HER gym apparatuses. And so they are specially designed to increase the resistance gradually at a rate that older people can handle. But it wasn't just the her um, equipment, it was that it was delivered by a physiotherapist. So the physio assessed the person, designed the program, did the program with them. They took them off the machines and did balance training on the side. So balance was a very, very important component. Um, and um, it, the, these pneumatic resistance equipments were really good. So this, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, has been supported around Australia. Is that right? I've read that somewhere, that, that, that this particular um, program, and I, and I fully support that. I think it's fantastic. I did wonder about the cost of the equipment and whether anybody done a cost effectiveness or a cost benefit analysis, but potentially that'll be part of the discussion as well. The second one is this trial, which was run by nutritionists. And the food was donated by Fonterra, which is a New Zealand company. So this is about dietary protein and calcium. They had 60 facilities, 7,000 residents. In the intervention homes, they gave them extra food. They gave them dairy servings and they gave them protein, and that is all they did. They didn't do anything else. And they reduced the hip fractures by, it reduced all fractures by 33% and hip fractures by 46%. That is huge. There was only an 11% reduction in falls, which is interesting in itself. Food donated by Fonterra. Okay, so here's the practice. There we go. Uh, lovely differentiation and separation of those lines between intervention and control and fractures and hip fractures and there's the force. So why are we not feeding our people in care homes? I mean, this was in the BMJ. Everybody reads the BMJ, right? So why don't we stuff it under the government's um, noses and tell them to make sure people in care homes get fed? This is a very, very simple, impactful um, article. I'd be really interested to see what impact it had in Australia. It was done in Australia. In New Zealand, I keep bang, ramming, you know, banging on about it as much as I possibly can, but people have more me as well. Okay, so let's move from age residential care to think about the community. So the presence of risk factors is different in the community versus age residential care. So the main risk factors for falls, we all know it's not rocket science. Having a history of falls, gait problems, walking aid use, vertigo, Parkinson's disease, anti-epileptic drugs, all of those things predict falls in community dwelling um, samples. Those same risk factors predict falls in age residential care as well. Harder to unpick that. 
So that's those um, those um, risk factors are important to think about. So this lovely person, Deandra, did both of these systematic reviews, and they really still are absolutely worth reading. But you've also got to think about your population. What's the difference between the prevalence of those risk factors in the community versus residential care? Previous falls, well, 60% of people fall in, in a facility every year, only 30% of people in the community. These populations are completely different. Um, assistive devices, pretty much everybody in residential care, not many in the community. Impaired ADLs. Everybody, you have to have impaired ADLs to get into nursing homes. 15% in the community. So these populations are really different. Dementia, 70% versus 6%. Are living over 80 years of age, 70% of people in residential care versus 15 in the community. So the populations are really different. So it makes sense that what you try to do in the community, if you just do it in residential care, it might not work. If you take what you're doing in residential care and you just try to do it in the community, it might not work either. So you have to take a step back and if you like, start again. So there's also a series of Cochrane reviews about community falls prevention. And same group of people are involved, different order of, um, uh, order of uh, authors. 159 trials, 79,000 participants. Exercise is really the core thing about falls prevention in the community. Um, the Otago exercise program has been adapted and used all over the world. It's not used much in New Zealand anymore. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> it drives me mad. Um, and it's really effective. And that is the basis of the home-based exercise program and the group exercises. They are all lower leg strengthening and balance retraining. And here in Australia, you've got the balanced people who really emphasize the importance of balance for falls prevention in the community. Um, and so that, that's important for falls prevention, but also uh, fall related fractures are reduced with an uh, adequate amount of home based exercise. Now, I like to think of exercise as medicine. And if you stop taking your blood pressure medicine, your blood pressure goes up. If you stop taking your full prevention exercise, your risk of falls goes straight back up again. So whatever those exercises are, you've got to make it so that the people can keep doing them at home and keep doing them and keep meeting. The Otago Exercise Program got adapted to a program called the SAGO, which is steady as you go, which is one hour of exercise a week of the Otago Exercise type, done in a group of people, and it is designed to become facilitator-led, um, uh, you know, peer-led. So you have a facilitator for the first 10 weeks, so a peer takes over, carries on with that group, the facilitator goes on to the next group, and it's designed so that it's self-perpetuating, so people will do it in the local form, uh, gold coin donation, and there's about 3,000 people in through Otago Southland who are doing it and maintaining their uh, well-being, and, and it's, uh, it's a great thing. The other thing that's really important in the community is home safety assessment and modification. Again, the same thing. Assessment alone is no good. So a checklist at home for the person to go check off their house and say, oh, I've got these rugs are wrong and there's no light bulb. Unless you fix the light bulb, unless you pack the rug down, it's not going to make a difference. And it's actually much better to get an occupational therapist to go along and do it because the occupational therapist understands the interaction between the person and their surroundings and can do a really great job. So home assessment and modification. Most health services have this as part of the geriatric services. Do you have it in Perth? Yeah. Okay. Is there like a six-month waiting list? In New Zealand, it's an eight-month waiting list. So I'll be falling down the stairs by then. And then once they've ordered their home modification, it takes another year to do the home modifications. I've been writing to my ministers about this too, because what's the point? That's two years. Home safety assessment and modifications in a timely way. Medication ed education and feedback to prescribers. This is becoming a much more interesting and effective thing to do because older people have lots of pills. Here's a picture of some pills we got from a guy's 
are not necessarily vitamin D in the community because they are at a lower risk of vitamin D deficiency. Here's a list of pills that we got from a little old man's place. And so this is polypharmacy. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you can read it, but this one here says the tablet. I wonder what was in it. And this one here is Valium, that wonderful drug that is so good for your Paul's wrist. And this one is Innocent, which is also really good for you not. Um, so anyway, this was a, a Melbourne, this when I was an assistant geriatrician in Melbourne. And um, the other really interesting thing about this is that a lot of those bottles were full. So this is called intelligent non-compliance. And I think that this person who, uh, yes, he was confused and yes, he was a bit disheveled and we were worried about him, but he hadn't actually taken the Valium, that's the most worrying one for fourth prevention, um, um, and he only took Indesid when it was really sore. So it is very interesting looking at people's pills. And as a GP, I just love talking to people about their pills. But you have to educate your doctors so they stop the right ones and start the right ones. Because it's not just stopping everything. You've got to start some of them, like the bisphosphonates for your bone health. Okay. Exercise for falls in people with cognitive impairment also is proven to be effective. So not just people, you don't exclude people with dementia. It's hard to do. But if you have an exercise program that is run well, it's likely to be effective. This is our Kathy Sherrington who did this um, systematic review. So I really think that we've got to focus on getting the exercise out there. So facilitating the community providers that you can, referring people to them, persuading your health funders that this is the most effective and most uh, efficient falls prevention act uh, exercise activity that they can do. So it was group or individual, and it was again focused on lower leg strength and balance retraining. Okay, mention of a couple of other things that I find are really interesting. This is perturbation training. Now, <laughs> this is where you're actually trying to trip people up. You're trying to push them over. And it's a very successful form of prevention intervention. Now, why would that be? So I've got a friend in Germany called Jochen Klink. And the first time I was on a perturbation trainer, it was with him in Germany. So you're walking along on the treadmill. I think you've got a harness on. Um, and then all of a sudden, the thing goes sideways like this, the actual floor. And so you go like this, and so, you, and so it's automatically. And then we walk along, and then randomly, because of, if you knew it was coming, you'd react randomly. And then it goes forwards like this. And so what it does is purposefully challenge, in a very sudden way, your balance mechanisms. Now, why should that work? Well, just think about children. Children fall over all the time, don't they? And it isn't very long until they learn to walk. And then they do, then they grow up and they do really dangerous things with their balance and, and with their reactions and things. But what happens when you hit about 50 or 60? You generally stop doing all of those things, right? You don't have an opportunity for your neuromuscular, nervous, muscular, those, um, all those feedback things you've got from your muscles to your, your spinal cord, all of the stuff for the long tracks and short tracks, all of those things, you don't do that anymore. And so I think that perturbation training wakes up a system that you used to use all the time, but you don't use anymore. So they've done trials where even one episode of doing this results in a 50% reduction in problems over the next six months. I mean, that's extraordinary extraordinarily effective. So don't forget perturbation training. And then Stephen Lord does it by having people walk along something on, on the floor and suddenly something will flip up so that you actually trip over it. And so that's the same kind of thing, making you have an urgent response um, involving your balance and your muscles and your coordination. So perturbation training, very interesting to think about for prevention. Okay, I'm nearly finished. I'd like to just ask you all to think about these next few slides. So we know that accumulation of risk is important. So if people have three or four risks, they're much more likely to fall over. I'd just like us to try to think about this 
by categorizing the risks as the risk of a related to the person, the risks related to place and the environment, older people, the context age residential care, the exposure, the risky activity. And I started thinking about this because Stephen Law did this very simple study where he had a colleague in China. So in China, they have a much lower fall rate, go figure. They don't hardly fall over at all. So he uh, had a study where they did evaluations of the fall risk, um, fall risk uh, parameters of Chinese people, of Australians, and of Chinese Australians. So people who'd been here one or two generations, but were exposed to the, to the culture of, of Australia. And so the Chinese had this fall rate. The Australians had this fall rate. And the Chinese Australians had a fall rate in the middle. Now, why would that be? And then they do the complicated regressions as they do. And they found that the one thing that leveled them all out was, of course, the fizzy which is your fear of falling scale. And they followed this up with some qualitative interviews and the Chinese people in China said, we're very careful about our health. We're very interested in our health. And we think about things before we do them. And they also do Tai Chi three times a week in the, in the outside area, right? So they're doing lots of balance challenge. When they talk to the Australians, oh, I do whatever I want. You know, I climb the ladder and I cut down the grapes and I'm doing everything I want, you know, you know, they're not thinking about injury. And Chinese Australians have been influenced by the Australians, right? So the place and the environment and the risky, and John Campbell always said, how do you measure those risky activities? So I'll give you an example. <laughs> My father, uh, when he was 86, came home to visit him from where I was working. I would have been up to you down. He said, Oh, Nairi, I painted the roof. And I went, What? And he said, Nairi, I knew you'd be worried, so I tied myself to the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was immediately imagining him banging off. <laughs> but he was a man who had always been a farmer. He had always been on top of the sheep and he'd always been doing dangerous things. He did think about the injury risk, so he tied himself to the chimney. And, and the next year I came home and he chopped down this huge conifer tree in his front yard by climbing halfway up with a chainsaw and lopping the top off and then lopping the rest off. So he was incorrigible. He always had risky activities, but he actually never had an injury. So that balance of risky activity with ability is important. The place and the context is, is really interesting as well. So Jochen Klink and I talked about this a few times more, and Jochen wrote this paper. And this is about the accumulation, the cumulative fall risk. So let's just look at this area here is about the intrinsic risk factors related to the person, right? So frailty, history, fall, balance, impairment, hypertension. This is hypothetical. So you could just sort of guess whereabouts those risks were, so you know where risk levels are, you know when somebody has a hypotensive thing. So we're arguing that this risk is dynamic, changes over time. They know you've got the activity in the environment. So you've got people's transfers, they have a little blip with the risks here. You've got them episodes of walking, you've got a risk changing with bicycling. And then you've got the environment. So you've got lighting, you've got the floor conditions, you've got staircases. So you can see how down here, you can imagine this accumulation of risks is quite dynamic. And then something about the accumulation of risks at that point pushed him over the threshold and he had a fall. I think this is useful to think about. It's hard to operationalize. But maybe we could teach older people about this. Maybe we could get them to think about what they're doing and not climb on the roof, Dad. Um, or potentially be more careful about the water in the shower. Or potentially think about if they've just had their hip done or if they've had some arthritis in their knees. These risks will be more than usual, so they have to modify this. So 
since then, we've been trying to work out how we're going to measure this. And I met this other guy, Rabinovich, Steve Rabinovich in Canada, and he set up a fantastic study. Five minutes, yeah, thank you. Where he was videoing older people. Um, so uh, they are people living in care homes, and the video monitors are there already. And they worked with the home to get permission to look at all the videos. And they captured hundreds of falls. When Steve Rabinovich gives these talks, it's like, you just, your heart is in, the, in your mouth because he shows the video and there's this little old Christian he's just about leaping up to try to catch them. So here's one of them. Here's a little old lady. This isn't the video, but it's some clips. So here she's walking along and then she turns, weight shifting and turning. And oh, here she goes, backwards against the wall and down. So here's her accumulated risk. She's got high risk of her physical frailty. Here's the activity starting to increase that risk even more until she reaches her threshold. So I thought these videos are quite useful to think about operationalizing this definition. Here's another one. This is a couple and there's a dog, right? So here they are walking along and then something happens. I think he trips over the the lead or the dog or something and over he goes. So he's got something going on in the environment. He's at high risk already. He's talking to this lady. You can see it on the video. So there's some distraction and conversation going on and he's reached his risk and over he goes. And one, one more. This one is even, I don't know whether you can see it or not, but here's a little lady in the dining room. She's with her walker and she's got a wheelchair behind her. So there she is leaning back into the wheelchair. The wheelchair breaks and not on, it goes backwards and down she goes. So there's a definite interaction with the environment there. These things are very useful to think about how we would go about preventing these falls. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Um, so falls prevention, clues for clinicians blood pressure and medications, proper cardiovascular assessment, gait assessment, think about the conditions, think about cognition. And then of course, we always forget about what to do after the fall, think about recovery and rehabilitation. And clues for organizers, food. Whoever would have thought about food, we all know nutrition is good for people, but let's feed them. Let's think about exercises and balance. Let's be preventive about that. Let's think about home safety and let's make an integrated system which puts all of those things together. Okay, I think that's the end of my time. Can you do the questions online? Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> Do we have any questions online? So just a reminder for everyone online to pop your questions into the Q&A tab. Um, do we have any questions from the room? Oh, yes. Repeat the question. Um, I'm just wondering the study on uh, nutrition. Yes. Um, how much less was the protein in the diet that is, if there's currently, you know, given in less amounts, so is there anything around that? Is it 50% less, 75% less? Is it um, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the table. <laughs> but it's pretty well documented that people in care homes don't eat enough protein or enough calcium in their diet. Yeah. And so I think it went from something like 70 grams to 100 grams, something like that. And with the calcium, it went from almost zero dairy serves to like five. So it was quite a big change in the diet, and that's quite well described in the paper too. Does it feel from criminal? Doesn't it feel criminal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so obviously, so yeah. you know, and I also had some colleagues who, who were uh, working in homes as, as dietitians. And they had to prescribe the butter and cheese on the clinical um, budget because it doesn't come on the food budget when they, when they know somebody needs water. It's really 
on on being angry and like yeah. We read. Oh, Mary, thanks for your wonderful talk. That was so good. Um, I'm really interested in what you think about the role of GPs and forms because there's been some trials that it's actually very hard, can be hard to get GPs to take part in those kind of research. And also, where as allied health ways encouraging people to talk to their GP about forms. But of course, I don't think still many GPs ask people. And then when the person does say that, well, it's like, oh, well, all right. Um, you know, um, and yet the other side of that is we've shown statistically in our studies and other people have too, that if people's GP recommends they do something, many of them will go and do it. So you really need the GP, even though sometimes it's difficult to go, oh, you really need them to go, oh, you should go to that exercise class, but there's a little gap by I think anyway. What yeah, is you, you are a GP. Yeah, I'm a GP, so I can be a GP too, Pam. So um, but I know we have missing GPs are too. And I know that older people are more than represented in the waiting rooms and the population treatments, but the older people come in with things that they want. GPs are very focused on delivering what somebody asks them to do. And older people don't come in and say, I've had a fall, or they may, or they may not. And to get people to do things systematically is really hard, but it's not impossible. So I've been trying to get GPs to change behaviour for ages, and it does work if it's something that the person comes in and asks them about. So, my, so the green prescription trial, which was about uh, changing activity in older people, um, the person in the waiting room, the researcher in the waiting room gave them a little slip which said, please give me my green description and the patient just gave this, the, this little slip to the GP and the GP said, oh, you want your green description? Fine. Got it out of the bottom drawer and wrote it every time you open it. But without that little slip, could you get the GP to reach into the bottom drawer and pull out the green description and give it to the older person? No, the older person has to ask for it. So it's a matter of educating everybody. Educating the older person, their families, educating GPs. I'm always talking at them about falls. And they all say, oh, yeah, that's important. That's really good. And they might try to do a bit few more medication reviews. It's got to be driven by the patient to make it actually work. And this is why I still do general practice because when you're in general practice, it is so busy and you've got so many things coming at you from everywhere else that a new research thing you're supposed to do is just not going to happen. Unless it's absolutely built in. So let's try to build it in in a way that's un, un, unavoidable. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. How, you know, we've been talking before about risky behaviors and educating people around risky, risky behaviors. How do you think you might balance that between? Not making them fearful of actually yeah. doing things that actually do challenge them appropriately. Well, I think that we do it through rehabilitation and re enablement of people who are becoming deconditioned and do it with a, a planned therapist type approach. So, this is where your allied health has got to be involved. So, and we had an interesting discussion with Jill about um, intrinsic or inherent um, ageism, where uh, where people think oh, I can't do that anymore because I'm old. You know, that's ageism itself. It's not the right thing that they should be saying. Yes, I've accepted it. Oh, well, I've got a broken leg, so I can't actually climb those stairs. That's sensible. But yes, yeah, so it's a really tricky balance. I totally agree with you. And it's got to be a raising of awareness about the risks, but also an encouragement to engage with them. And to engage with exercise therapy as a medicine. To prevent your future falls through improving your balance and your own esteem. Yes, we did wanted to ask for the um, perturbation training. Do you know if there were um, participants that have any cognitive impairments in that? Or uh, it just very, no, they, of course, they, they would have to give consent to be tripped over like that. So there wasn't very many people with advanced dementia, but that's a really good question. Should we get some people with moderate cognitive impairment to do it to see whether we can detect some changes. I think we need the sports 
science guys to really study these mechanisms. I know one professor who was looking, you know, had his sort of fast and a slow feedback mechanism for your nerves. Well, they were looking for a third mechanism, which might explain some of this. But that's all conjecture to me. I just care about whether people fall over or not. And if you can jog them along and make whatever that mechanism is work better, then yeah, it's quite good to keep people with dementia. <laughs> Don't try it at home. You've got to have a harness on. Thank you so much, Nari. Um, we have run out of time for questions at the moment, but we will have a panel a little bit later, so there will be more opportunities to ask questions as well. Um, Nari will also be presenting next week at the AAG conference for anyone else that wants to listen to her again. <laughs> um, I would like to welcome up our next speaker, um, Sue Kitchen, to talk about our newly updated post fall management guidelines for WA healthcare settings. So Sue Kitchen is a clinical nurse consultant and clinical lead in falls prevention from the Sir Charles Gardner Osborne Park Healthcare Group. So welcome, Sue. Come on, live. Oh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to, to speak on this topic. Very hard act to follow. It was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> anyway, so I'm here to talk about WA and to talk about the post fall multidisciplinary management guidelines for West Australian healthcare settings 2023. It's a really big mouthful. Post fall guidelines is what I'm going to refer it to. Uh, I have to give full acknowledgement to the working group um, who have been helping me this year uh, to uh, review the guidelines and to develop further resources. They're absolutely amazing. So thank you guys. So these were originally adapted for use in WA in around 2013. And then in 2018, there was a huge review uh, which pretty much developed them as they are looking now. In 2022, we knew that we needed to do a review, but it's a pandemic year, the staffing shortages, system issues. So what we decided to do was to aim to update and make sure that they remain safe um, for guiding practice. A working group uh, was taken up from volunteers. Their requests went out to the uh, WA Falls community of practice and volunteers were gathered from there. And we had 18 and they're comprised of nursing, OT, physio, and we sought expert opinion from medical and pharmacy. Once we had developed the penultimate version, uh, we sent around a survey to over 3,000 staff and consumers and organisations in WA gathering opinion. The survey responses were very, very positive and really just indicated that we were on track and that the guidelines were appropriate. So these guidelines now ensure the continued delivery of safe patient care. They will ensure that we uh, detect that early clinical deterioration they will reduce the risk of further falls and harm from falls. They contain guidelines for nursing, medical, occupational therapy, physiotherapy and pharmacy. And they have been recommended in the world guidelines uh, for use for post-fall care. So I think we must be doing something right for, to get that almost endorsement. So I'm only going to talk about the changes. Um, in the definition, we use the WHO definition, but we have also included a sentence from the World Health uh, Guidelines, from the World Guidelines, and uh, that also includes all syncopal events. That was their recommendation. We have um, expanded definitions and clarified. These are based on um, multiple uh, inquiries that are made to myself and to colleagues on what is a controlled fall, is a roll out of bed actually a fall? You know, um, and if a patient puts himself on the floor, is that a fall? 
So we hopefully have made this very, very clear to everybody. Uh, from, the, this, from the survey, what came through was that staff wanted more information about um, how to protect themselves um, from patient falls. Uh, it's beyond the scope of these guidelines currently. That's a whole body of work. Uh, but we have put in a section to say that staff need to be familiar with best practice uh, manual handling within their local area, so abiding by local policies. And we have suggested that these policies and guidelines locally contain information to guide the staff on the management of the falling patient. We can't recommend it because actually there isn't any evidence out there. So all we can do is put a strong suggestion in. And then in 2020. Six, I think it is when we review again, we will um, look at trying to include something. So the, the pathway, I uh, haven't put a picture of the pathway up, but many of you may be familiar with it. Uh, the only real changes on the pathway are that the palliative care, patient on palliative care pathway has now been put up front and center. It was actually in the 2018 guidelines, but for some reason was buried so deep but I don't think anybody knew that it was there. So we've put it into the actual pathway. And we've also put a goal of care check because we found that this wasn't being done and there is some evidence around that. So if somebody has had a fall, it's a perfect time to be reviewing their goals of care to make sure that we are providing safe and appropriate um, post-fall care. All the other pathways remain the same. So nurses are integral to falls, um, but particularly to post-fall care. They undertake the vast majority that is uh, uh, underlined in, in all of the, the pathway. They're responsible for coordinating the response as well as they're there 24 seven identifying any clinical deterioration. The pathway itself is considered nursing practice guideline. And there's other inclusions for nursing, post-fall huddles and clinical investigation templates, etc. But in 2026, we've recognised that this is a gap. And in 2026, there will be a lot more detail and more resources for nursing. Uh, from a medical perspective, there's no real changes in process, but there is potentially some new evidence next year. It's unfortunately not going to be out until the middle of next year on CT scanning and DOAX. And so we will probably have to do an out of session review for that. Let's see, can somebody tell me what the acronym stands for? Because I can never remember. It's anticoagulants, but it's it's uh, like um, not warfarin or. Oh, the bigotry. Okay. Those yeah. ones, yes, okay. sorry. <laughs> so anticoagulants, but not warfarin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, warfarin still remains absolutely um, high risk for injury, yeah, definitely. Uh, there was, uh, there is also a suggested template for post-medical, uh, for post-fall medical assessment. This is to enable medical staff to do what is best practice in terms of a clinical assessment for patient post-fall. Can't remember everything, particularly if you're junior and it's three o'clock in the morning. Um, and so this template can help. It's been trialled in uh, multiple places and it's now in use at Sir Charles Gardner Osborne Park and it's about to be in use at King Eddie's as well. Uh, we unfortunately have no longer have access to a wonderful video that was made by Nick Waldham and uh, Kate Ingram on medical assessment post fall, but we do hope that we can do another one next year. We also aim to develop a one page out or a pocket information for medical staff at their request. OT, uh, minimal changes here. Uh, like all of us, there's been a full review of current literature. They do have an assessment sticker and that's been altered to an ISOBAR format, but they remain focused on activities of daily living, patient vision, cognition and the environment. Physiotherapy, sorry, I should say that the occupational therapy group was led by Christy Harper um, and more OTs. Uh, physiotherapy group was led by Sandy Dumas um, and some more physios. 
it's become the, the physio post fall review is way more comprehensive. And it as does include the vestibular assessment, which for those of you that have had a chance to peruse the vast world guidelines, you will know that that is, is part, um, is recommended. They've also included two types of templates for documentation of ISOBAR and SOIA and updated the landward. Pharmacy, in 2018 guideline, the pharmacy post fall assessment was brand new. So it'd never been there before. The pharmacist said, you know, we want, we want an assessment, we want this guideline. This year, they've asked for resources. So that's what we've done. Uh, this has been done in consultation, obviously, with a wide group of pharmacists across WA. And the resources now include the medication-related falls risk assessment tool, uh, a list of common falls risk increasing drugs, so FRIDS, and the stop fall, which is recommended by World Guidelines as well. So we're hoping that some of those resources will be taken up. Also new is uh, the opportunity to look at interprofessional post-fall assessment. So that's essentially, instead of doing an individual physio and OT assessment, one discipline does them both. This was uh, developed by Fiona Stanley, so full acknowledgement to Fiona Stanley. And we have uh, utilized their resources, but adapted them to make them very generic. Um, and they will be loaded onto the WA Falls website for everybody to see. It includes guidelines, it includes training and education. Uh, It remains a guideline that is very much fit to purpose. It fulfills everything, but more so the patient remains safe and the staff remains safe. The 2026 one will be a much larger review than the one this year, and it will include a pre-consultation survey and a post. Uh, to, so it will be, everybody will be able to be involved. The publication, not confirmed yet, but we're hoping towards the end of the year, a lot of it is going to rely on the WA Health uh, Communications team and um, all resources that we have within the guidelines and extra will be all on the WA Falls website available to everybody. Um, this is the uh, group, that, uh, the working group, and I just want to say a very heartfelt thank you to all these members. Um, and the, the leads and specifically, which is uh, Christy Harper and Sandy Dumas and all the specialist experts that have helped us along the way. It's been a pleasure and honor to work with you all. If you want more information, please email either myself or this address. We're trying to keep all the inquiries in one place because that will also help us to look at how we review the guidelines in 2026. We'll keep these inquiries um, for, for as information that we might need to look at. There's just a couple of other things that I would like to tell you about. So the West Australian Falls Prevention Community of Practice or the COP for hospital settings, been going for multiple years now, probably 12 years, I think. And it's a wonderful group of health professionals who are just interested and mad about falls and passionate about falls. And uh, you know, we meet uh, three, three or four times a year. We get involved in different projects. Um, together, we have changed practice significantly across WA. Uh, if you want to know what's happening in falls in WA, if you want to have access to education or information or, or experts, um, if you want to be part of statewide projects that are planned for next year, then you need to be in this group because that's how you're going to find out about them. There is a leaflet out on the table um, and you can just use the QR code to register or send me a line. Uh, on the 29th of November, uh, myself and Lisa Campbell and Diane Robinson are going to give a webinar on the World Falls Guidelines. So they were recently published the end of September. They are quite amazing and part of what's in there I think certainly is going to change our practice and how we look at falls. To try and make sense of, of the, the vast amount of information, we thought if we gave a webinar that just gave a brief overview of each working group and each recommendation, 
for all the settings, um, this might be helpful. You do need to register. And that's a QR code and there's a poster out there as well, which you can register or send to or email myself. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. To that webinar today. Um, we don't quite have time for questions for Sue, but Sue, before you sit down, I'll get you to come back up for the panel. <laughs> um, so I'd like to welcome yeah, Sue and Nari back up for our panel discussion um, alongside panel members, Professor Anne Marie Hill, Senior Principal Research Fellow in the School of Allied Health at the University of Western Australia, as well as Suzanne Butler, Program Delivery Lead of the Stone Your Feet Program at Injury Matters. So tonight's hey. panel, yeah, tonight's panel discussion is themed the future of falls prevention in WA um, with a focus on looking forward as health professionals and uh, identifying what, what's needed to effectively work towards falls prevention um, in WA. I do just want to quickly remind everyone um, to make sure that you're using your microphones when talking, both when asking and responding to questions, just so that our online attendees can hear us properly. Um, and for everyone online, please do add your questions in the Q&A panel um, and approval alert off to those. Do we have any questions yet? No? Um, I will get us started with an initial question. Um, so tonight we do have a lot of health professionals over the different settings of community, hospital, and residential aged care falls prevention. What do you think is needed for us to work more collaboratively to address falls for prevention, both across health disciplines as well as settings? Yeah, nobody wants to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping right in. Um, NCA health and health consent. How do you make health consent together more easily? Um, I like to think about putting the patient in the middle, the resident in the middle, and everybody all automatically orients themselves to the um, their, you know, everybody wants to do the good things for the patient. They don't want somebody else to get on my back, and they don't want somebody else to get paid for something that I was going to be paid for. So I think it's a whole of system and ECOP kind of thing. You've got to have the, 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 the uh, interest of the patient right in front of you. Yeah, I think that's really true. No, the person is the patient, and yeah. the person who should be at the centre of things. Um, and with our research, um, a key thing that we're focused on and interested in, um, Yara and Zara is here tonight, has done a lot of work on this. I think that a really big gap is the transitions anywhere between those sectors. That, that's an enormous problem. You find that uh, people who go to hospital or go to residential care or transition care uh, or who are at home and they get unwell and they need to transition to getting some more help, that seems to be a place we really fall down in working collaboratively, and, and I think they're quite big gaps. So I do think that um, that's a, a really important gap that we need to figure out how to, how to play that gap. Um, I completely agree with all that. I think in the community sector as well, there's um, a lot of really great activities, programs, and interventions being done at a community level. People don't necessarily know about what other people are doing, and I'm a shameless plug here. We actually, um, I chair the Community Falls Network, um, and that's what our aim is. Our aim is to get a group, the groups of health professionals that are working in the community um, together to share resources, information, evidence, um, and we meet four times a year as well. Um, so we can put my details up there for anyone who'd be interested in getting the chance of reference and to join that group. Um, because we want as many people as possible on that group to share what we're doing so that we're not all individually doing the same thing and we can share the information and resources that we have. Yeah. 
different networks mentioned tonight so we've got the community forms network we've got the community of practice for hospital workers a few special interest groups is there scope do you think to integrate across the sectors these groups still how whenever people say uh, if they say they've had a fall or they know I've done falls research you know people are always shocked when they had an older relative fall over and they say oh my gosh they fell over they had to go to ED and they're like yeah that happens every 17 seconds and they didn't even know you know and whenever we educate older people um, you know I educated once an older man at Swan Districts who had already fallen and broken his leg he'd had a mild stroke and he was Italian. And afterwards, he was so amazed and said, why didn't anybody tell me there was any risk of all that? And he followed me out into the corridor going, you tell the other people this, you know. <laughs> and I think when you do tell all the people about it and say, you know, you really can keep yourself much stronger and that is great. You will be better and you also have fall. To a lot of older people, that is still news. They don't know it. And so I think we do need to get more older people leading. And that's where I love the Injury Council. You know, we worked with Injury Council some years ago on peer education. And uh, I think that's really important that we all get on board with that. And, and feeds into ageism as well, though. You know, making sure people don't go, well, I'm too old, so, you know, I'll just fall over. I think that's, that's still a prevalent problem around us. Oh, I don't like the question. I'll just turn to the food. We do have some. So let's go to a question online. Um, this one is for Sue. Is there a COP for aged care providers? And people can't do these two for very much. Okay, I'm going to leave soon. I'm going to be crazy. No, it isn't, and it does need to be more, definitely. Um, there's another one. Can we target GPs 
provide more information for residential aged care facilities to pass on to GPs regarding the use and benefits of vitamin D supplementation in regards to fall prevention. That's definitely what we have. <laughs> um, uh, so I've got a really story about that. So ACC in New Zealand, which is our accident compensation corporation, they had a thing about vitamin D and aged residential care. And so they got their community injury prevention workers to work with all of the nursing leads and all of the care facilities and audit the uh, medication lists of people and GPs are required every six months to review the medication list. So they had a little thing on there which said, prescribe vitamin D. And guess what happened? The vitamin D got prescribed. And so it happened through an audit process with direct feedback to the prescriber. So just get organized. You know, I think that's what you need to do is to ensure there's a couple of reasons why people shouldn't have it, but most GPs will know that. So let's systematize it with their major residential here with the, with the prescribing irregular reviews which already happen. And now, uh, you know, someone in the room who knows a lot about that, Dr. Jackie Francis Code. And yes, yes Jackie's published in BMC Health Services research about this because when she worked with uh, Brightwater, um, they did a complete order to all the vitamin D and then they used a number of different strategies. And one of them was getting the practice nurses to talk to GPs put little tabs on, go and do a whole lot of strategies. And if you have a look in that paper, you can see that systematically all the lower prescribing homes start to come up to the top levels. And so a lot of things that I think in fall prevention are about championing and doing the hard work at the local level. And I bet Jackie's paper certainly shows. And that was a community practice in the hospital community and stuff like that. Yeah. It has been done. I don't know whether the they're still doing it, but you should repeat that. Yeah, Jackie's just saying the way that worked in, in Jackie's research was um, by setting up a community of practice. So the community of practice actioned a lot of these things at the local level. So I do think communities of practice can work well if they're resourced. You know, the one limitation I think we have is, is resourcing and drivers. So I mean, you can have people um, set up a community practice, but you've got to have some support and be able to allocate a little bit of time. If you're a physio, you need the manager to say, yeah, sure, you take that one hour of the month to do that. So, you know, setting up um, the right drivers from the top down are important, I think. Thank you, Jesus. There's a really good point about the Home and got the condition 
And so they weren't doing the risky behaviors, they weren't going out and digging over the garden. And so in, actually in residential aged care in New Zealand, we didn't have any disease and hospitalizations went down and we actually saved lives, so that's weird. But the um, physical exercise levels of the general on the person really went down a long way. And I think we have to work really hard to try to encourage them to get back up again. So in New Zealand, we did one hilarious thing. Uh, during lockdown, we got the TV, we got half an hour of TV time, and we put on a session of everything to do about older people with older people at home. And so we had the physios doing the seven exercises, you know, the marching on the spot and the standing behind the chair and the heel raises and the and the stuff like that. And we had, um, I think I was talking about foods that you could eat, you know, baked beans was a really good thing because it was always in your in your in your in your cupboard. Um, and that we know that older people watch TV. And so they're the only people who do watch TV now. So now we're trying to get that as a regular, you know, Saturday morning half hour about healthy aging so that you can actually reach people at home. I also know that we're going to have to go for any communication methods that we can. So just like you and I got used to Zooming, I think older people can do that too. And there's some nice trials of tablets for communication, for health, um, for things like that. And there's nothing wrong with participating in a class where you can see what's happening on there and follow it along. So online delivery will be probably the way to go. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute essential for exercise, I think. And it's somewhere that we need to take our research. And we do have some trials in progress now. We've got um, a trial that's been run called the Top Up Trial, where we have a physiotherapist in Sydney, a really great person, Rick Dawson, who's prescribing people in care homes um, physiotherapy exercises online. They still need someone at the other end of the care homes. Um, when um, COVID pandemic restrictions first came in, um, we started a group of six of us, seven of us nationally physiotherapists in every state started the Safe Exercise at Home website. And that's now had over 40,000 hits of older people. And it's for older people and health professionals, but mainly for older people. And people can go, it's free, it's at home, you do your own exercise, you can download things for yourself. And we've now translated that into, I think, three languages. Um, and I think the key thing is that if you look online and look on Google or just go to YouTube, you can find hundreds of thousands of exercise programs. But the issue is you need them to be done in the right way. And I think that's, we felt our health website really filled that gap because we were able to confidently give a good level of advice and instruction for people who um, maybe had different disabilities. So I don't think it's something that we, we need to do more trials on quite urgently. And if there's any physios here tonight, it is something we're looking at. Um, we've had some tremendous success doing, uh, giving people exercise and videoing it for them and then, then taking that video program and doing it at home. So yeah, I think that's so something video we're doing. Doing. Yeah. What a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've, we've brought them into the clinic with the physio and they've got their program with the physio and done the whole thing for them. We've videoed it and they take the video home and do the program and we've run them up once a week. But they've only seen the physio once mm -hmm. and they've made significant improvement in the functional ability. So, I, yeah, these are certainly pathways that we have to look at more seriously. Yeah. And I've done that. My Sorry, inpatient, you just got the microphone. My inpatient, I work in some logics for the mental health. So I do exercise with patients and I take a video of them and then I send it to their phone. So when they get discharged, they have a look and they copy the same exercise. I really think that is something that we need to look at and investigate further because it's a a real pathway um, to increase the number of older people doing activities. What if they haven't got a phone or a tablet? What if they're digitally excluded? What do you do then? Precisely. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we do know there's that, I think it's about 30%. We, I just looked at that figure the other week. There's about 30% of people, I think, older people who still aren't online. Uh, so we need to, um, with those people, take the tackle first 
helping them to get online. And um, we ran a small trial. Again, there's Dr. Mazera, so she's the person that did that. Um, we we um, had um, a program and we've got some people online and we spent a lot of time training them to feel comfortable online. So again, I think a lot of um, a lot of scope for us to extend our reach. Thank you. We'll just move on to a couple of the online questions. Um, so there's just one. Um, is there any work or research being done to develop education for nursing staff on how to talk about false prevention with their patients when they have limited time? So what do they feel like from this or from short first? We're conducting a very large randomised trial um, of about 5,000 patients over several hospitals in Victoria, uh, where we've given a scripted, short scripted intervention to staff to um, talk to patients. So um, we're trialing that at the moment. Um, um, it's a randomised trial, so we won't have results for quite a while, but we are doing that. And we also um, have started a virtual community practice that's been running in all these hospitals for a good while to give staff education about how to have that conversation with people. And we're trying to work up a series of short educational clips and I'll just tell Jackie to run back to her office and keep working on it. <laughs> um, we're, we're trying to work up a series of short snippets um, that try to take staff from the thing of saying, please be careful when you fell, to having a more interactive, how do you have that interactive conversation with a patient such that they understand when you say, you know, about your safety and how I want you to behave while you're on board, how do you make sure that they pick up in a short and quick way what you're trying to say? So, yeah, it's something that is really important and we're working hard on it, but always happy to get more ideas. If the person online has got some, please email me. So do you perhaps want to comment on that one pager that you were talking about for the hospitals? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago in Herself, and she has developed a Māori uh, Falls Prevention Exercise Program. And she's based it on a lot of the um, so Māori dance, and Kapahaka has uh, certain movements. So she's incorporated those movements into the activity. So it is very social, they do it together. Um, and the success factors are about just that, making sure that it's an uh, activity that the whole family, the whole family can be together. Oops, stuff in his um, And uh, that program was funded by ACC and it will be disseminated throughout New Zealand. Māori are very uh, in, importantly insisting that things 
for Māori uh, developed by Māori because they will do it in a way that is acceptable to Māori and Māori will be able to engage in. So I totally, totally support that, uh, that meeting with New Zealand. And so, you know, watch that space. So Katrina gave a fantastic talk at the Falls Prevention Conference uh, just uh, last year. Yeah, and so I'm hoping she'll come back and tell us more about that the next one that's coming out. Um, I have a question from myself. <laughs> um, there's something that you said in your presentation, Larry, that stood out to me, and this is more targeted at, around older adults in the community. You said something about, I'm going to use the example that you used, of older adults that are given a home risk assessment and they're completing the home risk assessment, but then they're not doing the home modifications. So keeping that in mind and then also keeping in mind the fact that we addressed or we noted that there's months, months long wait lists to get an OT out for home modifications. What is the realistic next step to address that? Is it? And we have a health reform center. And one of the main things that the old people's um, group, working group, fed into the system was the need for more timely OT and allied health assessments because our allied health people get stuck in the hospital and can't and don't get out to the community. And I think it's common in Australia as well. Um, and I think that we shouldn't compromise the effectiveness of the strategy by saying, oh, it's taken care of because we've given them the self-completion checklist. That doesn't work. It might incorporate some changes but I think we've got to stick to the guns and do what we know is effective, which is an OT based assessment or at least a health professional based assessment. Potentially, geriatric services will, because of our aging population, get a boost in the next budget rounds. But we just have to make a noise about it, in my opinion. Um, I think it's very, I think, um, we have a gap in to that I hope that's provided in the community. I think that's a gap we need to work out how to address and we can address it in some ways by uh, using other workforce besides allied health. So we have allied health assistance, we have people going to work with, um, they might work with personal trainer, um, but at some point um, when people are getting a little older, then they tend to need an allied health type assessment and intervention. And, you know, so I guess that to me also is that issue of if you're in your 60s and you decide to go and buy something at Bunnings to just make your house a bit safer, that's probably fine. Yeah. Um, you might just buy a better outside light. But if you're in your 80s and you're having some falls, you know, I think you really do need an OT to look at your house carefully and um, put more really appropriate modifications in for you. And that, to me, does need um, you know, the, the skills of um, the right health professional. So I think that that gap um, is there to some extent, and um, we need to work out how to fill it. And I don't think myself that it's probably good use of our health hospital workforce to have them out in the community because they're busy enough in the hospitals and we need the OTs and physios in there. So I tend to keep looking around for other drivers and other ways we can build up the community workforce and our like health. I think that's something we need. <laughs> so one dollar spent in the community saves five dollars in the hospital. Take those our own health people and put them in the community and they won't be needed in the hospital. We're preaching to the choir a little bit here. <laughs> Can I, in an ideal world, yes. I think that we know what's best, best practice and what needs to be happening. In the meantime, is there anything that we can do to address that gap? Do we need to be trying to motivate old adults more? How do we do that? <laughs> So I guess my, another development that I've noticed has been quite useful are um, nav health navigators. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the Māori communities, they're called paiārahi, and they are usually community workers who come from the community. 
and they have skills which are added on by, by professionals. They can navigate those people. They can, you know, because they're from the community, they will know that Mr. Jones's house over there has the steps to put him down and that it's got a very dangerous situation and can navigate him into the system. So there are other health professionals that can assist with that navigation, but they also need jobs and they need training and they need support. So it has to be part of an integrated community approach to older people's health. Um, I think one of the things that I've noticed in the world guidelines as well is that there's a really good identification of the types of risks that older adults will be. And for us working in the community with, I guess, that particularly that lower group, lower risk group, um, who maybe haven't had a fall in the last 12 months, is what, which is what the guidelines are kind of identifying them as. Um, injury matters and stone your feet have resources that fit in that group as well, so we do have a home safety checklist. And we are about to launch a um, Romance Hazards game that we hope we're going to put um, plan together and in, hopefully we'll do some intergenerational work around that as well. Um, that people can go on and identify the, the hazards in a home, in their home, but also in this game. And it gives um, good tips and ideas that they can do to reduce the risks from those hazards. And so I think for that really like kind of low risk population, we've got some really good resources already that are available to use. <laughs> I hate to say that, but I will always say it. There is no evidence in action to check this building. And yes, low risk population, nice and safe, because of course we can't, can't do any harm, and potentially will raise awareness. But you've got to really try to do it properly if you're all clean. We did a trial a couple of years ago, and it was helped along with, we did it with Injury Matters. And we took two groups of older people who were reasonably low risk, quite large groups who were coming to Injury Matters events. And um, one group uh, received the standard, uh, you know, they had, they had a presentation and got some information. Um, and the other group, um, led by uh, Dr. Linda Kong, who's a really enthusiastic, really good physio, um, we designed a, a program for that other type of presentation where the um, presenter, um, whoever it was, uh, had little pauses in the talk and kept saying to people, now, um, you know, now for you, but what will you do here for this bit? What's your plan? And, um, you know, what will you do for this if you've identified and that hat and had to make a plan as the talk went along? And when we measured both those groups of people, both sorts of people said, oh, yeah, we, we did learn a lot. And, you know, it was pretty fun and we enjoyed the talk. But only the group that had received the more interactive thing, we then said, well, do you have some actions, things that you're going to do? And only the group that had received that interactive type education and goal setting said, yeah, well, I've got a plan. I've got three main things I'm going to do. So I, I do think that it comes back to still talking to older people and making sure, you know, for example, if I'm an older person, just knowing I should seek out an occupational therapist, well, you know, I'm not helpless. I can go around and try and locate one myself. Possibly I can pay for one myself. So that's fine. There's some occupational therapists on many high streets now. So, um, you know, those are things that I think it comes back to us, us really getting our passion over to the general population. All right, thank you. We're running out of time for the panel. So I'll get everyone to join me in just saying a huge thank you to everyone who um, contributed to the panel. Um, so Anne Marie is just going to provide a very exciting update to us um, about next year's Australian and New Zealand Police <coughs> Prevention Conference. Thank you, Jo. And I should have arranged to put a slide with the actual website up. But look, this is just a really um, big plug and so exciting for us in WA, particularly after our staying home for a couple of years. Um, the Australia New Zealand Falls Prevention Conference is on in Perth at the Entertainment Centre. 
the 26th to the 28th of November next year. So 26th, 28th November 2023. Now, if you just Google ANZFP Conference Perth 2023, you'll bring up the website. Please add yourself to the mailing list. There's a mailing list there. And we will open abstracts in the conference program at the beginning of next year. So it really promises to be an exciting event. You'll be able to see all the people that you've seen at other falls conferences if you've attended them. And this is a really big thing for Perth because we haven't had this conference here for a long time. And so all the people that we often mention, you know, we often mention, of course, Professor Stephen Lord. Oh, he's done all that work in perturbation. He's done so much work at falls. Well, of course, people like him will be over here talking. These are really good things for us. And also some international speakers. So again, we will really get a sense of enthusiasm and what's happening. Nari, we back. It covers all areas. I really want to emphasize that. So the falls conference, if you haven't ever attended one, it has a big section for residential aged care. It has a big section for hospital. It has a big section for the community. It talks about policy. It talks about economics. And it also talks about things like balance and gait and vestibular problems for people that are interested in those particular areas. It has a lot of talk on cognition, as we all said tonight, knowing cognition is a factor. So there really is something for everyone. And I want to encourage you to submit abstracts and make sure you come along yourself um, to the conference and join in. And it's a big opportunity. So spread it around your networks and begin to, um, you know, encourage your encourage your employer to consider subsidising you slightly to uh, pay your conference fee or things like that. And um, yeah, we really look forward to seeing you. I'm, the, I'm part of the local conference committee along with uh, Sue who's here and Alyssa, Kiara, uh, Jackie. So we're all part of the local conference committee trying to set it all up. And we are, of course, very interested if anyone has time. Oh, and of course, Joe is a part of the conference committee. And so we're very interested if people uh, feel they've got a little bit of time to contribute. Just some small things we need of, you know, advertising a little bit more. We, might need help a bit closer to the time and of course let's not forget the most important thing that we need to show that WA is the best place in the world and any conference here is the best conference ever and so I'm relying on you all not to let us down there because we have to show WA beats everybody else that is just remember so important now, the last thing I want to mention is this conference is novel as well because for the first time, the World Conference Group are coming here to have a part in the conference as well. So we'll have potentially a fairly significant subgroup of um, participants or conference registrants who are coming from Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, who are coming over to join in the conference. So that makes it an even bigger event for us. So potentially very exciting. So please come along and please consider also, would you contact me? We'll start to think about if we should have some conference workshops. What should we have? The people are around, people are coming from Victoria, from New South Wales. Perhaps we should have a few pre-conference workshops to talk about things that we were discussing tonight. These are things we should talk about. Or we've got these people here. Maybe we can have something for specific groups. So uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for that enthusiastic <laughs> push there, Anne-Marie. <laughs> um, just to wrap up for tonight, um, to keep the conversation going for today, we have already mentioned the Community Falls Network. If anyone is working in the community space and is interested in this network, then please do reach out to us um, via the details online. Um, I do also want to remind everyone that we would really love your feedback about today's event. Um, you'll all see that there are some evaluation forms on the table. Um, please do take a few minutes to complete both sides of the evaluation form. Um, we really do value your feedback. It helps us to ensure that we're delivering trainings and events that meet your needs. The feedback that you give to us tonight will help shape next year's Falls Prevention Forum. So 
please do take time to do that. Um, and if you're online, when you leave the Zoom meeting, the same survey will pop up on your screen. So again, we'd really appreciate if you could just take a few moments to complete that. Um, but to wrap up, I just want to say a final huge thank you to Nari for travelling out to Perth. As well as to Sue, Suzanne and Anne-Marie for your presentation and participation in the panel. Um, your knowledge is really valued by everyone here. Thank you. Thank you all and I hope you have a great night.